All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kate Conway Turner, president here at Buffalo State College. And it's my pleasure to greet you uh, this morning and to welcome you to our wonderful uh, Birchville Puny Arts Center. Um, I hope you have an opportunity to not only come here for this talk, but to come back at other times and experience amazing regional art here. But today, it's my pleasure to introduce John C. Williams, President and CEO of the Federal Bank of New York, to our campus here at Buffalo State today. Dr. Williams holds a BA in Economics from the University of California in Berkeley, an MS in Economics from the London School of Economics, and a PhD in Economics from Stanford University. Dr. Williams was previously the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. And prior to that, he was the Executive Vice President and Director of Research for the San Francisco Fed, which he joined in 2002. Mr. Williams has been a strong advocate for policies to stimulate the economy and get Americans back to work in the wake of the Great Recession. He has produced seminal research on such critical monetary policy issues as zero, lower bound, and the neutral rate of interest. As CEO of the San Francisco Fed, Mr. Williams focused on the development of the next generation of Federal Reserve leaders and fostered a, a culture of innovation, continual learning, collaboration, and mutual respect. He's a champion for creating a great, a diverse, workforce as well as an inclusive climate. And under his leadership, the bank made significant strides in achieving greater diversity in all levels, most notably among his senior leadership team. He began his career in 1994 as an economist at the Board of Governors. And additionally, he served as senior economist at the White House Council of Economic Advisors and as lecturer at Sa Stanford University Graduate School of Business. So bringing a wonderful background to us. Joining Dr. Williams for the Fireside Chat today is Dr. Fred Floss, professor and past chair of the Buffalo State uh, Department of Finance and Economics. Dr. Floss, research focused on forensic economics and macroeconomic theory. And also for those of you in Western New York, you will often see Dr. Floss on the media, both TV and in the news, talking about the economics of Western New York. So it's my pleasure to bring them both to uh, the chat and welcome them to Buffalo State. Okay. Yeah. Welcome to our tulip chairs. <laughs> uh, this is uh, a great pleasure. And before we get started, uh, many of you know that I'm not Dr. Ted Schmidt, who was supposed to moderate this event. Uh, he was looking forward to meeting a fellow Californian and was very excited a, a, about the opportunity, but his family had a COVID incident uh, yesterday and didn't want to get everybody sick. So uh, he wanted to send his well wishes and he had one statement that he wanted to make sure you knew, uh, that he wanted to open this d discussion by saying, a year ago, everyone was complaining that you weren't raising interest rates. <laughs> now they're all complaining uh, that you are raising interest rates. And he said, well, darned if you do and darned if you don't, <laughs> except he didn't use darn. So uh, we'll go uh, with all of that. So uh, we really do appreciate you here and a number of our students are using a lot of your papers and stuff in their theses and things. So people are really excited to be here. The other thing that I just want to make sure for everyone, for the students, is that we're going to have a 10 minute question and answer period at the end of this. And we'd really like students to be able to ask the questions. So I'm hoping that all of you are uh, thinking about the questions you want to ask uh, in a little bit. So why don't we get started? Um, given where we are now with the high inflation and strong labor market, and with the numbers coming out today, I don't know seen them. Uh, what are your views on the current economic outlook? Well, first of all, it's great to be here at Buff State. I've been looking forward to this uh, event, and uh, uh, it is a very interesting time for the economy and monetary policy. I mean, we really are seeing uh, extraordinary strength in the economy coming out of the pandemic. Uh, that's true across the country. It's true here in the Buffalo region. It's throughout 
uh, New York uh, and the country. Uh, you know, very low unemployment rate, which we again, we saw uh, again from the data uh, from last month, uh, very good job gain. So we're in an economy with a very strong labor market, uh, which is a good thing, except that we're also in an economy with very high inflation. And at the Fed, we have a dual mandate goal. We call them, uh, you know, we have two goals, which is maximum employment and price stability. So on maximum employment, things you know, look very strong. The price stability, we're a long ways from where we need to be. And really, our monetary policy decisions and, and, and actions and communications are really focused on getting inflation uh, back down uh, and getting our economy back on a path of price stability and alongside you know, achieving longer term uh, maximum employment. So right now, my view is that the economy is slowing uh, somewhat in terms of growth rates. Uh, we're seeing that in the numbers in GDP and consumer spending and business spending, and especially in the housing market where ho home sales have come way down. New construction on homes uh, have come down and, ho and house prices are, are finally starting to cool. Uh, that's how monetary policy works. Uh, we do raise interest rates. And you're right, it's never popular whatever we do. There's, uh, <laughs> that's part of the, uh, the, the reality of the, the, our work. Uh, but really what we're trying to do is you know, m bring demand and supply uh, back into alignment. We're, uh, you know, we go back to your first econ class that you've taken. It's about supply and demand. It's always about supply and demand. It's about getting the you know, supply and demand curves to intersect at a place where uh, we're in a sustainable economy, where uh, inflation is low and stable, and, and at the same time, we you know, have a strong labor market. So really, my view on the economy is we're, we're going to you know, we have a slow growth, um, and we're going to likely see the labor market uh, you know, maybe not be as strong in terms of the job growth we've been seeing, uh, because right now, uh, right now we're seeing very high inflationary pressures from our economy, uh, and really seeing supply and demand get back into balance, get demand, uh, which is far exceeding the supply both of workers, for goods, for cars, for everything out there, get it more aligned with supply and really bring inflation down over the next couple of years. So I do see uh, positive growth uh, next year in the economy. I do see the unemployment rate coming up somewhat, but most importantly, I uh, see inflation coming down pretty, pretty uh, significantly next year as, as uh, we see prices of lots of goods and uh, commodities come down and over the next couple of years get back to the 2% inflation. So I, I do see us on the right uh, trajectory of uh, the economy slowing somewhat, at the same time bringing inflation uh, down over the next couple of years. Great. You know, given what you just said, you know, what's the po Fed's policy do you think it's going to be? What are you recommending? And how will you know if we succeed? Yeah. Well, that's the really hard part of policy making is you all learn when you take economics, you, you, you learn about GDP and employment and inflation and, and all these things. Uh, but the hard part in the, re in the real world is that things are already changing. There's a lot of uncertainty about how the economy will evolve, but there's uncertainty about you know, things that happen that you didn't anticipate. We had the Russia's invasion of Ukraine earlier this year, and with all the uh, ramifications of that for energy prices, these are things that a year ago I, w I wouldn't have been talking about, but now are an important part of, of the economic uh, landscape. I mean, for me, the way I think about monetary policy is w you know, when the economy is weak, and I, you know, like after the re a great recession, uh, really it's a focus in getting America back to work. Uh, right now, the focus is really about getting inflation back down to 2% uh, and, uh, and doing that in a way that hopefully uh, keeps the economy uh, uh, growing uh, as best as it can. So what we're, you know, the way I think about monetary policy is I think about, you know, we set the overnight, uh, the, the federal funds rate, which is the overnight interest rate, um, and trying to get that interest rate, which is currently 3.1%, which is very low by historical standards, to a place where um, <coughs> on an inflation adjusted basis, so when you think about where the interest rate is compared to the inflation rate, that it's actually not boosting people's spending, but in restraining the spending somewhat. So what does that mean? Well, inflation right now, uh, underlying inflation is probably around four and a half percent. So it suggests that you need to get interest rates up from 3.1 percent up to somewhere around four and a half percent over time. That's kind of a, a, a view that my uh, colleagues on the FOMC, the committee, uh, have, have shared. Uh, I think that the timing of that and, and kind of how high do we have to raise interest rates, that's going to depend on the data. It's going to depend on what happens with inflation. 
employment, uh, the global economy where, you know, we can't just think about the U.S. economy, what's happening in Europe, what's happening in China and around the world, and how quickly does the economy kind of respond to the higher interest rates. Uh, again, my view is that we need to get interest rates up further and basically get interest rates above what inflation is. That will help uh, restrain the demand and get in line with supply uh, and do so in a way that you know, bring, starts bringing inflation down uh, quickly. Great. A, a lot of our students in money and banking have to look at uh, Fed's balance sheet. So. Not, wait a minute. It's not have to. They get to <laughs> think get about the Fed's balance sheet. Right. Right. Spoken as a good professor. <laughs> I, I agree with you there. And we've talked an awful lot in the past about QE2 or quantitative easing. I guess our one question is, is it now QT or is it QE2 tightening? And how do you think that that's going to work? Because you're obviously now going to be in charge at the New York Fed, yeah. making sure markets uh, react, hopefully. In a yeah. So uh, QE, QT, all of these are you know relatively new uh, ideas. They've been around actually a long time, but uh, in uh, but in terms of active use of using our balance sheet for policy, that really really happened around uh, starting in two thousand eight and nine. And and basically the idea of QE or quantitative easing is that the Fed buys securities in the market, treasury securities, mortgage-backed securities. Uh, we buy those securities, uh, like a 10-year treasury uh, note, for example. That bids up the price in the market for that. That lowers the yield on the security. It makes it cheaper to uh, eventually to, to buy a house, buy a car, or something like that. So buying these securities lowers interest rates uh, that affect the, the cost of borrowing in the economy. Uh, so we did that when the economy was weak. We, uh, back in, uh, in, in after the uh, uh, global financial crisis, we bought securities, lowered interest rates, tried to speed up the very slow recovery then. And then in the pandemic in, in 2020, uh, we did the same thing, where we bought securities, again, with the goal of getting interest rates low, getting people back to work, getting the economy back on track. Well, now we've seen the economy is way back on track. You know, economies uh, strengthened much quicker than many expected, and we have the very tight labor market. So now we're doing the opposite. Uh, we're basically uh, having our balance sheet shrink. Uh, we don't actually have to sell the securities that we bought them before. Um, they just mature and we just don't reinvest that. So that's happening right now. We are shrinking the balance sheet uh, uh, at a significant pace. And what does that do? Well, it reverses what we did uh, when we bought them. So we see longer term interest rates move up somewhat. Um, the cost of mortgages, as you've seen, uh, if you watch this, is, have gone up. Uh, and it, it basically works in tandem with as we raise the short-term interest rates through our Fed funds target uh, uh, decisions of the FOMC, it's also pushing up the longer-term interest rates. Even still, long-term interest rates are lower than we, in, in our, at least in our lives, <laughs> we're, we've seen, we saw you know, 20 years ago or anything like that. There's, they're not high, but they have moved up quite a bit. And by doing this QT, uh, or quantitative tightening or shrinking the balance sheet, it is one of the tools we, we, we are using to try to reduce demand, aggregate demand in the economy, get it back in alignment with supply. One of the things that the New York Fed, as you mentioned, we watch very carefully is how do the markets absorb that? Our balance sheet at the, uh, at the Fed, and we manage that in the New York Fed, is about $8 trillion. I mean, eight, trillion dollars is, is a lot of money by anybody's measure. And so as the Fed has pulled out of, you know, has allowed the balance sheet to shrink, we're watching very carefully how does that get, how do those securities get reallocated across the global financial system? Does it work smoothly? So far it is working uh, exactly as planned, uh, but it is something that we focus a lot of, of attention on. Oh, great. Thank you for all of that. So remember, that's going to be on the exam. So you're all set, right? You got that? Well, one thing is just so for anybody, you know, thinking about a career uh, in economics or finance, uh, you know, the New York Fed is, is an incredibly cool place to work. It's a, a remarkable place, but it's also a place that you talk about billions and trillions as a normal lunchtime conversation. So it's rather <laughs> unique in that way, too. <laughs> well, that's great. I know yesterday you were uh, going around Buffalo, you saw the county executive, you saw uh, the president of M&T Bank and everything else. I'm just wondering, you know, what you thought about all of that and, you know, why did you come to Buffalo? Yeah, so the, w the Federal Reserve is, um, has 12 districts, we're the second district. If you look at your currency, uh, paper currency, for those who are still using that, uh, it, it, you'll see some of the currency has a number 
letter in the corner. It says 1A or 2B. Or, so the 2Bs are the really good ones. Those are the New York Fed uh, <laughs> ones. But they're all the, worth the same. Um, so we represent New, the state of New York, northern New Jersey, western Connecticut, and Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands. So that's our district. Uh, and part of our job, my job, is to travel around the district, talk to leaders, business leaders, community leaders, government officials, other uh, you know, parts of our economic uh, and communities and understand uh, from people actually doing the work, people out there, uh, boots on the ground, if you will, uh, to add to our understanding, my understanding of what's happening in the local economy. So we came here before the pandemic and one of these trips for you know, a two-day trip and really heard a lot of excitement about the future of Buffalo and the Buffalo region. The population was actually growing yeah. after declining for, for many decades. That There was a lot of, uh, obviously, innovation going on, a lot of investment in the, in the economy. But then, of course, we've had the pandemic and, and a very challenging several years. So we really, one of the goals we had in the meetings yesterday and, and this morning is to see where things are today. You know, what, what, how has that changed in the last few years? How is the post-pandemic Buffalo economy looking? And really focus this time also on uh, the innova innovation sector uh, and you know, create the more of a startup culture that's starting to happen here in Buffalo. And that goes alongside the other very important industries we have. When one of the most important industries in this community, obviously, is education and higher education. But So that was an exciting part of learning more about uh, innovation in the startup culture here uh, in Buffalo, which is, you know, coming from Sam, coming from the San Francisco area in Silicon Valley, it, it, it's something that's exciting to see take root here in, in New York, and see it in New York City, starting to see it here, of you know more of an entrepreneurial startup culture, but also with the, the idea of you know really coming up with innovative ideas and bringing them to scale. So we saw some examples of that. So it's a lot of fun. If you're going to give any of our local leaders recommendations on where you think uh, we should go and what opportunities you see out there from your perspective. Um, what are your thoughts and maybe how you think maybe that connects with us being a border town yeah. of Canada? Well, I think the one thing that I've heard from leaders both in my previous trip here and on this trip is the importance of diversifying your economy. Uh, Buffalo's economy, if we go back maybe 70 years, uh, going way back, uh, was really a, a, ver a huge manufacturing city. And you see that obviously still uh, with the, uh, you know, the major steel companies that were here and, and others. And it's taken quite a while, uh, but it, there's been a lot of effort over the previous decades to diversify into uh, you know, medicine and, and medical fields and ed education into other types of manufacturing and services. So I think that, that and, and tourism, and obviously tr uh, trade uh, with uh, Canada being, as everyone pointed out, you can see Canada looking at you <laughs> out the window. Um, and we did tr uh, actually go across the, the Peace Bridge yesterday and, and step into Canada. But the, uh, uh, and they let us back in. That was, uh, they did that, yeah. But, the, uh, but I think that, that it's a diversification argument. And that's why, you know, when I, when I heard about, like, we need to find an economy that can weather storms uh, and, that, and it has growth potential, I think that's the right answer. And that's why the innovation aspect of that, of thinking about what are the new growth industries and startups and things like that that can bring more jobs uh, to the local economy in, in different fields, I thought was uh, an exciting part of that. I do think that you know, the, the basic source of growth in any economy is, gonna, is always going to be related to investment in either investment in technology and in capital investment and investment in people. And another thing that we talked a lot about both yesterday uh, and this morning is the importance of investment in K through 12 education, early childhood education, uh, college and, and, and graduate education, job training uh, in the trades. And I think that's a, you know, those are investments are happening. Those are actually crucial to have. As you know, it's all about uh, productivity. It's all about creating uh, high pay, higher paying jobs. And so those are things that I would say that, I, you know, I, we're seeing, but are really important. Great, thank you. Um, how do you think the regional factors, what, what things have you seen when you're talking to everybody, do you think they're gonna help us do some of those things and be innovative um, and are gonna impact you know, the economy? And what do you think the Fed has done that might help us do some of that? Well, one of the things, I'll answer the second part first because uh, 
you know, outside of making monetary policy, supervising the, the large banks and carrying out the, a lot of the payments uh, uh, in our economy behind the scenes. I mean, we do a very, a very important mission around community and economic development, and specifically kind of finding ways for our economy to truly achieve its potential, which means everybody in the economy by achieving their potential. So we, we, we and our colleagues, as we learned this morning, um, or we talked about this morning, our colleagues at the Atlanta Fed have also been um, uh, collaborating with local uh, uh, business leaders around how to um, you know, manage uh, uh, various uh, employment issues and, and, and uh, issues around uh, really broadening the pool of, uh, uh, of, uh, of potential workforce, but also uh, how to develop and, uh, careers and things like that. So we can, we can partner uh, with uh, uh, various community and, and business leaders. I think the other thing that uh, you know, we heard is, um, uh, in a way, Buffalo uh, finding that uh, community uh, kind of, I don't know, is it, is it pride or, or community kind of focus of how do we move this economy, uh, local economy forward? How do we work together on that? So we heard a lot of, as opposed to groups working at, at cross purposes. So we learned a, a, see a lot of that, a, a lot of uh, collaboration uh, and working together with government, with community groups, nonprofits, and, and with businesses. So one person yesterday said, if, uh, if we could achieve a Buffalo that is as aligned and working together as they are at every Bills game, uh, we would be amazing at what we can do. So we could just capture that. He also did mention, especially after Bill's win. Yes. Uh, th that's the <laughs> sense of uh, the alignment, which is happening a lot these days. So maybe that's a source of, uh, of strength. I also think that the international trade issue has been so challenging in the last couple of years. Basically, policies on both sides of the border, but especially on, on Canada's, have been restricting the movement of people. Uh, th that's, been a, that's been a strength for this region. Mm -hmm. And as we get more and more people, tourists, to come back and forth, uh, and uh, I think that's another thing to, to make sure that the area is leveraging. Well, that's great. Well, I'll ask one last question that they always ask me when we do these things is, is there anything else I've left out that you want to talk about? Well, I think um, the, you know, this is, a, again, a very challenging time. I, I, part of my job is meeting with the heads of the central banks from uh, from uh, countries across the, the globe. And uh, we meet every two months uh, and discuss what's happening. And all of us, uh, almost all of us, I should say, there's a couple out, outliers here, we're all facing very high inflation. It's not just the US, it's not just Canada, it's not just Britain or Europe, uh, it's in the Americas, it's in countries in Asia. I mean, the outlier there is Japan, which had deflation for quite a long time. They're seeing the highest inflation they've seen in, in decades, but it's l a lot lower than ours. Uh, and China is in a different situation too, uh, so I'll come back to that. But so we're seeing a, a global kind of high, uh, high inflation, different than the the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And we're all working, you know, on our own to make the decisions to bring the economy, you know, bring the economy back in uh, balance between supply and demand. We're all working to figure out how to bring inflation down. But it is an extraordinary kind of thing to see all, almost all the central banks in the world, like the Fed, raising interest rates, raising them very quickly, uh, more quickly than you saw in, in many decades, and really trying to understand all those linkages across the countries. We're seeing trade volumes come down. We're seeing supply chain issues actually go away very quickly, especially in, in some industries. So really, you know, understanding that this uh, it's the U.S. economy we're focused on, uh, you know, at the Fed, but it's, it's part of the global economy, global financial system, and understanding all, how all those interactions are affecting what happens here. Because we are, you know, a country that trades a lot. We're affected by what happens around the world, and what we do affects what happens in other countries. And th these are times like this, which are, you know, very difficult in terms of inflation and, and other factors, but uh, understanding that we're all kind of on the same uh, global uh, economic and financial system and, and working uh, you know, together to achieve uh, our various goals. Oh, that's great. I, I think it's time for questions. Is there some students that want to oh, raise yes. their hand? <laughs> I guess there are a lot. That's you know, good. I normally say at one of these things that uh, we need a brave student who will raise their hand because once one student asks a question, everybody else will, we got we got a couple. Brave student. This Thank is great. You. Pleasure to have you. Um, what sectors of um, reserve are being relied on the most during this time of uncertainty? Which are being what? 
um, like which sectors or like departments specifically during this time of unsurety, yeah. um, the inflations, I know data is hard to kind of get because of the inflation rates. Yeah. Um, what part of the um, Federal Reserve Bank um, is being relied on most yeah. at the moment? Yeah, no, that, yeah, that's a great question. And it's, 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 it's fascinating because depending on the events around us, some of my colleagues in different divisions are totally working 12 hour days, seven days a week, and others are sitting there like, okay, I'm waiting for whatever happens. And, and so during the pandemic, we, we had our folks uh, working on all of our emergency programs, uh, emergency purchases. We did more purchases of securities than we'd ever done in the history of the Fed in, in a very short period of time. And as one of my colleagues said, and we did it uh, wearing pajamas uh, from our kids' a bedroom in our apartment. Uh, so that time was when you saw people in what we call the markets group and research and, and, and some uh, extent in the supervision areas, you know, very focused. Today, I think it's really the re economists. Um, we've all, uh, I mean, I shouldn't say all, but the vast majority of economists have been very surprised by the rise of inflation. And when you're economist and you're, and you're we're data driven, right? Um, that when you're surprised by something, it's the time to roll up your sleeves, you know, check your assumptions, you know, rethink your models, re, you know, op open up the conversation, what did we get wrong, well, how do we want to think about that? So we have uh, around 65 PhD economists at, at the New York Fed, plus hundreds of economists in the, sy in the system. We have a lot of research assistants, uh, we have a lot of other analysts who are pouring over the data. We have great uh, survey data. We have a lot of micro data, not just the aggregate of the economy, but uh, you know, getting um, into the details. And then our folks in the markets area are watching what's happening in financial markets and what we learn from that. And, and our international economists, what's happening in other countries and comparing and contrasting. So right now, I would say our economists are uh, fully employed uh, and along with a lot of people following what's happening in, in financial markets and, and globally in the, in the economy. But again, it, it depends on the situation. You know, the things happen, there are things that happen, you say, well, that's kind of right in our wheelhouse, you know, market volatility. Sure, it, you know, we, 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 we watch this all the time. We, you know, we're, we're, we're very focused on financial markets at the New York Fed. So we, we have a lot of expertise in that. But then suddenly something will happen uh, in another country or in some market that we don't focus on, and you have to build that expertise overnight. And well, actually not overnight, in a few hours. Uh, and, uh, and then be able to address that. But right now, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting and challenging time to really understand, A, what's driving inflation, what's um, going to bring it down, and importantly, how do our actions, because we're making decisions that are consequen consequential for people and, you know, in our economy and around the world, how do those play out and what do we need to look at, again, to reassess, revise our, our views. I mean, the thing about making economic policy is you, got, you have economists, you have models, you have theories, you have everything you learned in school. And, and most of what you learned in introduction to economics, introduction to uh, macro, money and banking, that's it. I mean, you learn a lot more, because uh, I went, as you heard, I went to school for a very long time. Every time I hear that, it's a very long time. But, <laughs> the, but you really, those are the basic things, and it's really you know, just challenging yourselves, challenging each other to say, what did we get right, what did we get wrong, and what are we learning as we get a new data point? We got a new employment report for last month. Um, you know, our economists are going to be saying, well, what's that telling us? What did we learn from that? Mm -hmm. And then we're going to get another CPI in a few weeks. Yep. Is there another question? Yeah, we have a Mets fan. Yeah, okay. You got a prediction of how the Mets are going to do? Mets are going to win the World Series. All right, that's what I like to hear. <laughs> But as we see the Bank of England uh, shift from QT to QE pretty quickly yeah. um, because of the fears of the recession or their weakening of, of the pound, does the Fed take that into consideration before they make a decision on our uh, interest rates or are we kind of just focusing on what's best for us and not really what else is going on in the world? Yeah, so that's a great question and it's, it's multifaceted. So what happened in the UK, uh, clearly the financial markets responded very strongly to uh, some decisions of the new government, announcements of the new government around fiscal policy, uh, and that led to a lot of volatility in the UK financial markets. Uh, that did spill over into the US markets, to, uh, US bond yields, treasury yields, uh, German treasury yields, others uh, uh, went up quite a bit and then came back down as the Bank of England uh, took some uh, actions to try to restore, uh, I think, market functioning there. And those seem to have been, uh, you know, successful. Uh, so we have to, 
understand what's happening around the world? How does that feed back into the U.S. economy, into financial conditions, and, uh, and, and back into what's going to happen with our economy? So we study that. We understand how the global economic financial environment is affecting our, uh, um, uh, our economy's uh, outlook. We have a domestic mandate. Our goals are about uh, maximum employment in the United States uh, and price stability in the United States. So our decisions are going to be driven, uh, taking into account everything that's happening around the world. What is going to help us best achieve uh, our U.S. goals? So that's true of every central bank. The Bank of England, the European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, they all have domestic mandates. They all are focused on their own countries. So. But what about the fact that we're all interconnected? How do we deal with that? Well, as I mentioned, I, every two months I go to Basel, Switzerland, uh, and we all get together. We don't coordinate policy, like make joint decisions, but we inform each other of what we're seeing, how we're thinking about it. We try to be transparent and open about the issues that we're dealing with, the policy uh, you know, choices that we're making and why we're making them. And one of the things we've really learned in, from the past is the more we're transparent publicly about this and the more information we provide about how we're thinking about it, what our forecasts are and things, the better other countries are, can prepare for the fact that you know, when the Fed raises interest rates, and we are, we, you know, we've raised interest rates quite a bit this year, that affects every economy in the world. And there's no question about it. The U.S. Is, you know, may not be the biggest, you know, the, uh, the share of GDP in the U.S. Is, is less than what it used to be in the global economy, but our financial system is still, the, and the dollar is still the, um, you know, vitally important for the global uh, economy. And so really it's about uh, in being transparent, uh, and, uh, and being as predictable uh, and s as systematic as you can be in policy. That way other countries don't get um, surprised uh, uh, or somehow feel like you know, they weren't prepared for what, what's happening. So really we have the domestic mandates. We take into account all the information around the world, uh, but you know, really try to uh, be as transparent and, and uh, you know, consistent in ways that allow other countries to take their decisions in a way that we're you know, not creating excessive uh, volatility. I will say in terms of QT, you, didn't, um, you know, you got to that. I mean, this, the, what the Bank of England was dealing with was a very difficult situation because they were doing their own QT for monetary policy reasons, just as, you know, we are. And they had to deal in a short-term issue with financial market volatility, and it looked like QE, but I think from the... You know, from their, I can't speak for them, but from their point of view, they were dealing with a, a market functioning issue, a short-term issue. Uh, but it is a challenging thing. You know, you're doing one, you know, you're buying securities for, for that purpose. You want to shrink your balance sheet for another. Uh, and uh, it just shows you the complexities of carrying out policy uh, in, given the volatility and uncertainty out there um, and the fact that uh, we all are in the same boat about needing to get interest rates higher and, and get inflation down. We have another. Oh yeah, I can't see. Right, uh, <laughs> right in front of the, uh, right in the middle here. Yeah, let's get you a mic. Hypothetically, if there was no inflation, how would it benefit the world or like affect the world if there was no? You know, I, so that's a great question too. I mean, that for a lot of. Uh, people um, and, and probably a lot of people in this room, you, know, you haven't had high inflation uh, in, in your lives. Uh, I grew up in the 70s, which I hate to admit, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and we had very high inflation, you know, uh, over 10% inflation. Uh, and so, uh, you know, so the, the, I'm going to reverse your question a little bit. I mean, the problem with high inflation is there's multiple problems. One is, it, in the long run, it doesn't achieve anything. It's, it doesn't allow us to have you know, more jobs or more GDP. And in, in the end, it's just high inflation. And countries that have run it, um, uh, it ends up, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't get you anything uh, in a positive way. So there's no trade-off between inflation and, say, employment in the longer run. The second is, is it really, we, we've done research with the New York Fed. We've highlighted this. Others have done research on this. High inflation it, it harms uh, everybody in terms of the higher cost of living, but especially the people who are, you know, uh, really where the essentials are a big part of their income and a big part of their shopping, you know, whether it's rent and food and, and, and uh, you know, energy.
energy, gasoline, and things like that. So for, for those who have lower incomes, how the higher inflation hits them the hardest and they're least uh, able uh, to uh, kind of pr prepare for it or, or adjust to that. And so there's a high cost of, of, of high inflation. And, you know, and the third is the, the, it's just the idea of the, the uncertainty around it. You know, in the past when inflation has gone up, and then gone back down. It creates a lot of macroeconomic, uh, you know, less macroeconomic stability, less ability to plan for the future. So the lesson I think, you know, for me is what it would it look like if we had low inflation. Hopefully, it looked like what we were getting to before the pandemic, which is an economy that, you know, we had low inflation for 30 years. We had an economy that was able to grow, um, you know, very long expansions, you know, record-breaking long economic expansions. We saw very record low unemployment or lowest unemployment rates in 50 years. And, and a strong, uh, stable basis for the economy. So I go back to what I saw before the pandemic was an economy that was actually doing the best it had in many respects and the macro view, a macroeconomic point, point of view, uh, and that the low inflation was an important part of that. So, you know, again, from my, you know, policy views, we can get back to that low inflation in the next few years. We can get back to that, you know, having long, uh, really ro robust and sustained uh, expansions. What we get. Yeah. This room has very good acoustics. Yeah, <laughs> it does. It does. Hi, uh, uh, thank you for being here. Um, you mentioned earlier about how interest rates, even with the increases, are still very low, especially compar in comparison to decades ago. And I was wondering if, with the rise of you know dependency proliferation on credit, especially for all kinds of consumer things. Do you think that those, even those increases, while small in comparison to the 70s, will have disproportionate effects to you know, consumers, people in the housing especially, right. and anything like that? Uh, uh, another terrific, uh, uh, really uh, uh, good question. Um, so I do think that it's different than this, uh, you know, previous decades about where, it, you know, the, the in the comparison is, is not, it was just uh, kind of just a general comparison. I think you're raising that there are differences. So I'll highlight two. Well, one is in mortgage, I'll give you an example, mortgage finance. Higher interest rates uh, translate directly, uh, higher mortgage rates directly into the ability to get the mortgage in the first place. I mean, we have much tighter regulation since the housing crash and the financial crisis, much tighter regulations and rules around mortgage or originations and, and to get them uh, to be conforming mortgages. And so because of that, higher interest rates make it harder to meet a test of being able to pay uh, a rent, uh, you know, pay a, a mortgage payment. So I, I do think that these higher interest rates do have a bigger impact maybe in that market than they probably did in the past. Uh, housing's always been very interest sensitive. Monetary policy always affects housing a lot uh, in the short run, but I think that that channel may be even stronger. The other is, um, you know, the topic that I've spent my last, uh, I guess, 20 years of my life on, and that is that, that you know, the normal level of interest rates today, I mean, even if we weren't in a recession, uh, you know, we weren't, we're not in a recession, I shouldn't say that, but we didn't have high inflation or and it, we it, even separating from where the economy is, um, the normal interest rate is just, or neutral interest rate, is just much uh, lower today than it was 25 years ago. And by, a, you know, a order of magnitude, maybe two percentage points or, 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 or more. And so if you think about that, it means that comparison of a Fed funds rate of 3.1% today, um, that's a significant rise from January of this year, but it's, it's actually a tighter monetary policy than a 3.1% would be, say, in the, in the early 90s or something like that. And so why are interest rates, again, abstracting from right now and the high inflation, but why have interest rates come down for the last 30 years, and you know, the 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 I think the economists have really identified three major factors. One is demographics. Uh, generally, in the world, uh, people are living longer. Um, uh, there's they're saving more for retirement. Two, the birth rates around the world have, have dropped significantly, so population growth is less. What does that mean? People are saving more, but we don't need to invest as much to build the economy of the future because population growth is really much lower today here and around the world than it used to be. And the third is productivity growth, despite all the innovation, despite all the new products and things, is, is much lower today than it was, say, back in the 90s or, or uh, early 2000s. So all these factors, which reduces demand for investment and, and new investment. So there's a lot of factors that are kind of making interest rates 
e even in normal times, much lower than they were, say, 25, 30 years ago. And that's what the, we were experiencing before the, the pandemic. I mean, you know, interest rates around the world were close to zero. Uh, in the Fed, you know, we were able, when the economy, because of the economy improving, to get interest rates a little bit above, you know, 2%. But that's so much lower than they were uh, in previous decades. So I think we have to remind ourselves of that. There are things have changed. Maybe the sensitivity of the economy to interest rates has changed. And importantly, what's a normal interest rate has changed. But that's something that's also hard to, to pin down. I mean, you know, so much has happened in the last couple of years with the post-pandemic economy, the, you know, the uh, uh, early retirements, a large-scale retirements and uh, reductions in labor supply we've seen, um, all the discussions around uh, issues like uh, bringing companies back in, uh, you know, and re uh, maybe moving away from globalization. So there's a lot of factors that may be changing that, but I'm still, you know, I think that the, your question is, hits upon an important point that, you know, the, this is a different economy than it was 25 years ago, and it's one probably with lower interest rates and maybe, you know, monetary policy clearly is having uh, big effects, um, even with pretty low interest rates today. Mm -hmm. Now we got one more. Okay. Hello, so I was wondering, um, how do we plan that the money being invested will affect the economy and are there any targeted issues toward the community and the community growth? So how do I, right at the beginning, I didn't, I missed the first couple words, that's it. So how do you plan that the money being invested will affect the, the economy and are there any targeted issues directed toward the community and community growth? Well, so, you know, I guess my, my what I think is the most important thing here is really investing in areas that are going to basically provide longer-term growth, like you know, like the workforce issues we talked about uh, before, getting people prepared for getting jobs, thinking about where are the future jobs and how can we create uh, investments in technology that will uh, you know create those here. I think the other big issue is uh, attracting people uh, to the, uh, the the various areas. Uh, like in, say here in, in Buffalo, the Buffalo region. But I do think a lot of this is about, you know, getting the, the people prepared for the jobs that are here, uh, here, getting businesses to create new jobs and new opportunities, and getting all those things uh, to fit together. So to me, it's, it's really this collaboration between, you know, getting, helping the, uh, invest in the workforce, help, help invest in people in terms of education, and have employers investing in the workforce and in the education so that the people who are prepared for jobs are the, one, the same ones that are preparing for the jobs that employers are looking for. Okay, so you get, wait, Great, I think wait. we're running out of time. Wait, come on, but one more. I, one more, I, okay, I, one more. I, I always say I one appreciate more. it. Um, inflation being a high topic at the moment, um, also, especially as a college student, um, student loan forgiveness is also a big topic, especially with Joe Biden's new policy. How would um, the student loan um, debt of more than $1.7 trillion um, affect the Federal Reserve Bank if it's forgiven in any way? If so, would it affect neg negatively or positively? Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer the, the way I have to answer that question, then I'm going to tell you what I think about it. So my first <laughs> answer is, the Federal Reserve does not make fiscal policy decisions. Those are decisions of the U.S. government and the Congress. So you, you knew that, but I'm, I'm just going to put out that's not a decision that we, we're involved in in any way. Okay, but that's not what you asked. Uh, <laughs> and I, uh, so you know, our economists, and, and this gets back to an early, earlier question um, about you know, what we, you know, what we focused on, we have to understand whatever is going on in the world in, in the U.S., even if we don't have any you know, uh, involvement in making those decisions. We need to understand what will happen to, you know, consumer spending, what will happen to business investment, what will happen to inflation. So we have to do that. We do that on, on climate issues. We do that on, on fiscal policy or a lot of other issues. We don't make those policies, but we need to ha understand how they work. And that's one of the exciting things about working in the Fed, by the way, uh, that you get to work on a lot of interesting new topics um, because we need to understand everything that goes on in the economy. Okay, back to... Um, student uh, uh, loan forgiveness. I mean, it is something we've looked at in terms of trying to come up with estimates on, on its uh, direct effect on the economy. So I'm defining it narrowly. I'm not saying whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but on, its, uh, on, on the economy. And I think the 
conventional estimates we have is it, it, it won't have a big direct effect. It will probably mean consumers have more money in their pockets and will spend a somewhat more, but that's not a huge game changer in terms of the overall picture uh, of our economy uh, in the short run. Obviously, it's very important for the people who are affected and all that. I take that for granted. Um, but I think that that's not, the th that's a thing that, you know, on the margin would, would be a little bit faster growth and, and, and something that we would take into account is, as we think about where the economy is, is uh, moving uh, and and, and the you know and how we, we think about uh, uh, understanding the economic outlook. It's again we always have to come to some kind of assessment of how will people behave. Like what will they do if they they see their debt is now forgiven? Um, what will they? How will they uh, change their spending decisions or their saving decisions? It's very hard to know because these aren't things that we have a lot of experience with. Uh, but I guess my basic answer is. My going in uh, estimate would be that this doesn't have a, would not have a big first order effect on the overall U.S. economy. But again, any policies that change, we always have to watch the data, analyze it, and our economists and analysts, you know, look at what happens and, and then we reassess. These are really terrific questions. This yeah. is very impressive. Uh, uh, great well, conversation. Well, with that, I want to make sure that you know you're always welcome <laughs> back. Uh, we'll have a place on the faculty for you if you want to come and teach. <laughs> so I think we can probably swing that, right, <laughs> President <laughs> Turner? And why don't we all thank... Uh, a big hearty <laughs> Buffalo State thanks. <laughs> thank you for a terrific discussion. Thanks, uh, Professor Foss, for moderating it. And you're always welcome at Buffalo State. I have a small gift for you. Terrific. So you were wondering if you would get away with having the uh, color. No, okay. you're out of the Here way so everyone can uh -huh. see. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your Friday. Thanks, everybody.